And that means it's time for us to begin our Wednesday night midweek Bible study. We have been studying and will be studying for several weeks to come. Uh, the gifts of the Spirit. The gifts as described by the Apostle Paul in our initial text of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, verses 1 through 11. And we finished last week, we finished up uh, doing a basic uh, explanation and definition of each of the nine gifts. And this week we're going to move forward in our study. Uh, the direction that we're going to go in, I'm going to go ahead. I, I thought maybe we would do it this way. There is an entire chapter in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 14 that the Apostle Paul um, addresses the gifts of the Spirit through the entire chapter, uh, the 14th chapter of 1 Corinthians. So I thought perhaps what we would do is we would go ahead and walk through the entire chapter of 1 Corinthians 14 and see the instruction that Paul has to offer concerning the gifts and then Following that, we're going to be moving into some more exposé on specific gifts. Uh, and the specific gifts that we'll be looking at will be word of knowledge, prophecy. Uh, we're going to look at uh, prophecy. We're going to look at false prophets. We're going to look at uh, how we know a true prophecy from a false prophecy. We're going to look at examples of New Testament prophets versus Old Testament. Everybody pretty much understands Old Testament prophets. We're going to look at uh, the examples of New Testament prophets. We're going to look at uh, prophecy as a gift that comes with an office, and uh, then we're going to look at uh, the gifts of healing and examples in the New Testament of that gift as well. All right, so this week we're going to begin um, a breakdown and a look, a careful examination of the Apostle Paul's writings to the church at Corinth the 14th chapter. Before we begin, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Master, we love you, God, and we thank you. Lord, we are so grateful every single time that we have the opportunity to come together as the people of God and to explore the Word of God. We're grateful. There are people throughout the world that do not enjoy the freedoms today that we enjoy, and for that we are grateful. We ask God today that the anointing, the presence of your Spirit would be ever so real as we delve into the Word of God and as we strive to understand that which the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. We ask, Lord, that you would open our minds, open our hearts, Help us, Lord, to understand the Word of God. Help us to understand your ways, your precepts, and your truths. And help the teacher today, O oh God, to do an adequate job in helping God's people to a place of revelation and understanding concerning these important truths. We ask it all tonight in none other then Jesus' precious, wonderful name, amen. Praise God, amen. Now you might notice a lot of times I don't have a Bible sitting on my lap open. Uh, I just don't go through the formality of trying to look religious. Um, 
I print out the passages on my notes. So I have the entire passage printed out. If you look at my notes, you'll see that all it is is scriptures. There's I don't there's not one single word written in my notes except for like a heading. For instance, you know, I have a gift, uh, gifts of the Spirit as a heading. And then like, you know, scriptures that deal with prophecy, I have prophecy, so on and so forth. Um, but that's, that's all I basically have, especially with Bible study a lot of times. That's all I have for notes. So we want to look today at 1 Corinthians 14. I'm not going to read the entire chapter through and then try to break it down because it's a very long chapter. 1 Corinthians 14 has some 30, uh, 9, 40 verses, and so it's a long chapter, so it kind of be wasted to read the whole thing through and then try to go back and break it down. So what we're going to do is just read a portion, and then we'll talk about it, and we'll move along through the entire chapter as we do this. Before I read the, uh, I begin to read to you, uh, from 1 Corinthians 14, let me help you understand a little bit of background. In our church, we talk all the time about the importance of understanding context. You have to understand context. Nowhere in the New Testament do the authors ever claim that God set them down and ordered them to write what you hear as I dictated to you. This is the position taken by fundamentalist and evangelical churches. It is an erroneous position. The claim is made that the whole Bible, whole Bible, hallelujah, glory to God, Genesis to Revelation is verbally inspired by God. That is the biggest pile of manure that you'll ever hear. Nowhere, 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 nowhere is that claim made. If there is a book that is even close to being verbally inspired by God, it would be the book of Revelation, the new... New Testament book, that is. Obviously, some of the Old Testament prophets, you know, would fall into that category. But in the New Testament era, the New Testament is written to us under a very different anointing and a very different dispensation because it's serving a very different purpose. In the Old Testament, God had to inspire Moses to write the first five books of, of the Bible that we call the Pentateuch or the books of the, you know, the Law of Moses. Uh, God had to inspire Moses to write for any number of reasons. Number one, Moses was not present at creation. Therefore, for Moses to write anything about creation through the exodus of the people of Israel from the land of Egypt, uh, he would know nothing about any of that. He wasn't there. He was born in Egypt. He was born as part of the Hebrew captivity in Egypt. So anything prior to the Jewish captivity in the land of Egypt, uh, Moses would be unfamiliar with, okay? So therefore, uh, all of that required a prophetic revelation from God, all right? And uh, unlike most prophetic revelations, which involve the future or things to come, Moses had a unique um, experience in that God gave him a prophetic uh, inspiration that looked backwards. And he was able to see things that had already transpired in history. 
obviously at the time of Moses there was no videotape, there were no uh, uh, audio tapes, there were no recordings of any kind, uh, there was precious little that had been committed to paper, and, and even if it had been somehow committed to paper, uh, the number of people who would have access to that material would be very, very limited because uh, it, you didn't have mass printing presses, so it's not like they published books by the tens of thousands and they were available for everyone. So, uh, you know, a lot of people try to label the Bible as being illegitimate and not being accurate and not being dependable because there is little uh, historical evidence to support some of what is written in the Bible. Well, I'm so sorry that when you go back thousands of years, they didn't have videotape. I'm sorry they didn't have laptops and they were not able to record all this. I am sorry that history is written by the victor. Meaning, when the children of Israel, for instance, left the land of Egypt, the nation of Egypt was humiliated, was embarrassed, their gods were poked fun at by the God of Israel. It would only make sense that as was common in those days, they could expunge everything that even spoke of great leaders, pharaohs in Egypt. And we know historically that there were pharaohs that fell into uh, disapproval. And therefore, uh, pharaohs that came after them literally went backwards in time, as it were, and erased every mention of them, every single place they could find it, so that now we know precious little about those particular pharaohs who were in disfavor because everything that was recorded about them was uh, taken away. Um, it is not at all hard to understand that the Egyptian people would have uh, erased everything relative to the captivity of the Jewish people because the release of the Jewish people and the way it transpired and the circumstances surrounding their release was so humiliating and so embarrassing that it, it is not at all difficult to understand. They would have done everything in their power to uh, erase any mention of Jews in Egypt at all. That's the way it worked back then. And like I said, it's not like you had publishing companies that were putting out tens of thousands or even thousands or even hundreds of copies of documents so that maybe one or two documents, you know, somehow, some way would kind of wind up off in the boonies somewhere and you'd find it later, you know. Uh, no, that, it's, it was very easy in ancient times. If they wanted to obliterate something from history, it was easy enough for them to do that. So Moses wrote under a prophetic anointing, looking backwards, okay? Uh, the New Testament comes, and the New Testament serves an entirely different function. The Gospels are written for one specific purpose. Four of the Lord's disciples took it upon themselves. They don't claim that the Holy Ghost told them to do this. They took it upon themselves to commit to history a record of their experience and their understanding of the birth, the life, the ministry, the death, the burial, the resurrection, the ascension of Jesus Christ. So four of the Lord's apostles, his disciples, took it upon themselves to share the story of the life and times, as it were, of Jesus Christ, which we call the Gospels. 
There are those in fundamentalist circles who want to tell you, oh, there is no conflict between the Gospels. The Gospels are in perfect harmony. Again, I say, uh, that is bunk. You know, folks, I'm telling you, if you grew up in a fundamentalist church like I did, there was so much crap you were supposed to believe just because they said so, okay? That is how fundamentalism and authoritarianism uh, share something very much in common, which is why evangelicals and fundamentalists love authoritarians, because they are so caught up in the mindset, believe what I tell you because I say so. And much of what is taught in fundamentalist churches is doctrine that is formulated. A lot of it is through history. A lot of it is through tradition, not through Scripture. And then they will turn around and they will go to Scripture and they will try to rewrite it and retranslate it and reinterpret it to make it say what they've already determined they want to believe. Okay, now, from the book of Acts, the book of Acts is a continuation of Luke's writing of his gospel, and so, or his record of the gospel, the life and times of Jesus Christ. And as Luke words it, he said, I've already told you what Jesus began to do. Now I'm going to tell you, O oh, Theophilus, is, that's who he was writing his uh, record to, was a man named Theophilus. He said, now I'm going to tell you what Jesus has done since, basically, he ascended. So he's still talking about Jesus, and he's still talking about what Jesus has done and is doing. But now... He is speaking of the operation of the Holy Ghost. We've talked about it before. The Holy Ghost is just another way of saying the Spirit of Christ. So what he's saying is, okay, in my record of the Gospel, this is what Jesus did while he was visibly here. In my record in the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, this is what Jesus did, not being physically here any longer, but now being spiritually here in and through the church and through his people. Now, after you get through the book of Acts then, which is the only historical book we have that records the history of the actions, the messages preached, um, actions taken by the apostles and the early Christian church in the first century. The book of Acts is the only singular historical record we have of the early church. Once you get beyond the book of Acts and you get into Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians, Thessalonians, so on and so forth, you get into the epistles. The epistles are merely letters. They are literally communications that various apostles, Peter, James, uh, John, Paul, Paul wrote the majority of them. They are letters that these individual apostles wrote to various groups of believers in different parts of the world. Some of the believers were Hebrew, some of the believers were Gentile. In some locations, like in Rome and other places, uh, the audience was mixed. The church consisted of both Hebrew and Gentile believers. There were unique circumstances and situations going on in each of these bodies of believers. And the apostles were generally responding to very specific situations that were going on in the location of the believers they were writing to. Why is this important to understand? Well, again, fundamentalism wants to tell you 
that all of a sudden Paul went and fell into a trance. I'm in a Holy Ghost trance. The Spirit says, baloney. Never happened. He sat down and said, I need to write a letter to the church at Corinth. I've heard some things. There's some things going on there that I need to address. Those people need some instruction. They need some clarification. And I'm certain that he, if he's anything like most great men of God, he probably said, Lord, help me. Help me. Just like when we preach, we say, Lord, help me to preach, to speak the truth, to to be effective in communicating. And I'm certain that Paul, if he didn't voice those words, I'm certain that he had those thoughts in his heart at the very least. Lord, help me. You know, I need to communicate to these people. Help me to communicate to them in a way that uh, they will understand and uh, that they will receive and accept. So the apostles wrote not under an anointing of inspiration per se. Now, again, I'm not saying that there was not inspiration present, but their primary catalyst, their primary support in anything they wrote was not inspiration. Their primary support was authority. Jesus Christ gave the apostles the authority to establish the foundation of the church. That is why we are taught that the church of Jesus Christ is built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. What prophets? The Old Testament prophets. Why are they part of the foundation? Because they predicted, they proclaimed in instances, some instances, thousands of years in advance, those things which would serve as evidences of the identity and authenticity of the Messiah. So, the apostles, excuse me, the prophets are very important because Without the writing of the, the prophets in the Old Testament, we would have no way of authenticating Jesus Christ as the promised one, the one that God promised, the Messiah, okay, the anointed one. So we have the writing of the the I keep wanting to say apostles, I think we have the writing of the prophets in the Old Testament, which point to identify, verify the identity of Messiah, which is, we believe, Jesus Christ. And then you have built on that, you then have the apostles. These are men. The very term apostle means one who is sent. The apostles met a very specific criteria. The apostles were men, A, that the Lord himself called and sent, that he gave authority over the church to, and they witnessed him after the resurrection. They literally saw him after the resurrection. The only apostle after Judas killed himself, the only apostle who met that criteria, the only man who met that criteria, was the man Saul who became the apostle Paul, which is why... Jesus Christ appeared to him on the road to Damascus. Paul saw the risen Christ. The Bible said, 
None of the other men on the road, they saw the light, but they didn't see Jesus. Paul saw the Lord. Okay, that was a requirement for apostleship. Okay, so, um, and then the Lord, of course, called Paul to minister to the Gentile believers who would believe on him because of the gospel. All right, so the epistles are basically simply letters that were written by the apostles. But the apostles had a very specific God-given authority. So what they say carries tremendous weight because they had authority given to them specifically by the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? So therefore, you cannot easily dismiss the writing of the apostles and say, well, the apostles weren't inspired like the prophets of the Old Testament were inspired. No, they weren't. But they wrote under authority. All right? And therefore, their writing has uh, every bit the same weight, as it were, of inspired writings. Do you follow what I'm saying? It's just that the uh, anointing is different. There's, you know, there's, there's prophetic anointing and there's uh, the anointing of authority or, or authoritative anointing. So now we get to the church at Corinth. The Corinthian church was a body of believers who became rather obsessed with the gifts of the Spirit. Oh, they were thrilled with the manifestation of the Holy Ghost. Many people over the centuries, even since the Pentecostal revivals of the early part of the 20th century, many people kind of become have become obsessed with the gifts of the Spirit because they're they're amazing. I mean, it, the gifts of the Spirit are, are awe-inspiring. They're wonderful. You know, it's a it's a glorious thing when God Himself manifests Himself through His Spirit in the midst of His people. It's a wonderful thing. It's it's glorious. However. There also is a certain amount of practicality that is necessary if the church is to carry out its mission. And we are to evangelize the lost. We are to equip those who already believe. All right? We're uh, the, the responsibility of the preacher. The apostle Paul told Timothy... Preach the word, be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. So uh, the church has a dual function. First of all, our function is outreach and evangelism, okay? Reaching those who are unsaved, those who are lost. That's, that's part A. Part B is educating, inspiring, uplifting, encouraging those who are already in the faith. And we ought to be helping those who are already in the church to walk a deeper walk and a closer walk with Jesus Christ. That's what a preacher ought to be doing. That's what a church ought to be doing. We ought to be helping God's people into a deeper, closer, more intimate walk with the Lord. How do we do that? By helping them learn more and more about the Lord, learn more and more about His teaching, about His ways, okay? Uh, preaching against queers, preaching against drag queens, preaching against this, that, and the other thing. Got news for you. That does absolutely nothing in helping God's people to have a deeper, more intimate walk with Christ. Nothing. Serves no purpose whatsoever. 
How does it help in winning the loss? Doesn't help there either. So why, why do you do it? Serves no purpose whatsoever. But the church at Corinth had kind of lost its way. It had become obsessed with the manifestation of the Spirit. I've known people over the years in my life who all they ever wanted to do was go to church and all they ever wanted was for the, the church to have a shouting Holy Ghost service. That's all. You know, it, it, they would chase every church in the country to find one where all they ever did was shout and dance and have church. Now, listen, if there's a preacher in the country that still believes in good old-fashioned Holy Ghost worship, it's me. Trust me. But... While that is wonderful and marvelous and it serves an important function, talk about inspiring and uplifting and encouraging good Holy Ghost filled worship and manifestation of the Holy Ghost does all those things, okay? But the church should be as much concerned with growth, not, not numerical growth, spiritual growth, growing deeper, setting our roots deeper in the faith so that when the winds of trials and tribulations come, we're not easily blown over, okay? Like a tree with, with shallow roots, you got to set your roots deep. And so uh, it's very shallow, to simply get caught up in the manifestation of the Holy Ghost and not understand. Like, I've known preachers over the years who were very gifted at preaching the way I word it is, feel good sermons. They could hit all the high notes. Oh, I mean, when they preached, people could shout and run the aisles and get happy. And it's not that they were bad preachers. It's not that what they pre were preaching wasn't good. What they were preaching was lovely. The only problem is what they were preaching, every word of it, we've heard a thousand times before. You ever heard the saying, preaching to the choir? Well, you know, if you want people to get happy and shout and run the aisles, just preach to the choir. Preach what they've heard a thousand times before. Preach what you know excites them. Preach what you know gets them happy. Preach what you know they get thrilled about, okay? You go into a one God, Jesus name church, you start preaching on one God and Jesus name baptism and boy howdy, those folks are bound to get happy. But then you get preachers, and I dare say, I'm, I'm, I know I'm going to get flack from somebody because without fail, it's going to happen. But you get preachers like this guy here who believes in digging deep. You know, I heard Brother Ward on a video I was watching a couple weeks ago, and he talked about preaching meat and potatoes and not just preach and he did preach meat and potatoes there's nothing wrong with a preacher acknowledging that they're a preacher of meat and potatoes and i got news for you honey anybody who knows anything about our church knows we're a meat and potatoes church we're not a milk and cereal church if we were we'd probably have a whole lot more people than we do you're trying to do an affirming work, an apostolic affirming work on top of everything else. Uh, boy, howdy, all you do is make it harder and harder on yourself when you preach meat and potatoes. Because meat and potatoes requires that the hearer be of a certain mindset, that their heart be in a certain place that they have a desire to grow. 
that they have a desire to mature. And not everybody is in that place. The Apostle Paul talked about, in one place he talked about, you know, having to preach and teach to one group of believers milk. He said, I, I have to give you milk. Because honestly, that's all you guys can handle. He said, but you need to desire, you need to have a want for something more substantive. You got to get to that place, man, where milk just don't cut it anymore. Well, the church at Corinth was kind of milk happy. They didn't care what the preacher said as long as it was something they could shout about. They were obsessed with speaking with other tongues. They thought that speaking with other tongues made you spiritual. That the more someone spoke in tongues, the more it was the manifestation of their deep spirituality. When that is not necessarily so. You don't necessarily have to be deeply spiritual to speak with other tongues. People receive the Holy Ghost sometimes the day they come to the Lord. They're not deeply spiritual, you know, they're, they're just new to the faith. So, uh, you know, obviously it's not about being, but they, from that day forward, they may very well worship and pray in the Spirit. It doesn't make them deeply spiritual. That is not a manifestation of deep spirituality. But this is the mindset that the church at Corinth had. And they were especially, especially obsessed with speaking with other tongues. That was the one thing that they just kind of ran with, you know, they ran away with. And uh, so now as we read the 14th chap chapter of Paul's letter to the church at Corinth, understand this background. He is writing to, listen to me, listen to what I'm about to say. He was writing to a charismatic church about Pentecostal doctrine. And let me see if anybody caught that. He was writing to a charismatic church about Pentecostal doctrine. What do you mean, Pastor? Got news for you, honey. The whole charismatic movement that started back in the 1970s was nothing more than a revival of the church at Corinth. People who were obsessed with the manifestation of the Spirit, particularly speaking with other tongues. Uh, then they'd get carried away with people being slain in the Spirit. And all of a sudden, it became evidence of one's deep spiritual walk with God as a preacher of the gospel. If everybody they laid hands on fell to the ground as though they were dead. We call that being slain in the spirit. There are a number of examples in scripture where this transpires. Where prophets, when, when the Lord would reveal himself to a prophet, the Bible said uh, that they fell to the floor as, as though dead, okay? Basically, all it amounts to the human body is overwhelmed by the presence and power of God. It happens. We've had it happen in our church in Dallas. We've had visitors come up for prayer. And we laid hands on them and started praying for them. All of a sudden, they fell out on the floor. And when they got up, they stood there and apologized to me because they had never had that happen before and didn't even know what happened to them. They didn't even understand. They said, I just couldn't stand up. My body just gave out. You know, I understood what was going on. They didn't. But the charismatic movement as a whole 
became obsessed, becomes obsessed with uh, spiritual manifestation. And oh, it, yeah, it's so spiritual when you go to a church and everybody's talking in tongues and they sing in the spirit and oh, and it's so wonderful when it, everybody that goes up for prayer gets slain in the spirit. But a lot of false thinking and a lot of false beliefs start to be born out of this obsession with the manifestation of the Spirit. For instance, in charismatic circles, I, I grew up in, in New England. The charismatic movement was humongous in New England when it started. And uh, what happened is many people developed the false belief that when you went up for prayer, if God did what you were asking Him to do, whether that be healed you, delivered you, whatever, uh, you had to be slain in the Spirit. That was evidence that God did whatever it was you were asking Him to do. And that is so far from the truth, it's not even funny. And here I was, 19 years old in southern New England, pastor in my first church and I'm having to come up against all this stupidity and all this uh, false ideology and I'm trying to explain to people you can come up for prayer get prayed for turn around and walk away never feel a thing not even get a little tingle and find out you're as healed as anybody that's ever been healed Find out you're delivered as anybody's ever been delivered. There is absolutely no biblical precedent or it's absolutely no biblical teaching that suggests for even a half a second that you must be slain in the spirit in order, you know, for God to have done anything for you. Catherine Kuhlman back uh, in the 60s and all in her ministry uh, this was something that frequently happened when she prayed for people. Benny Hinn has carried that practice on and many in the charismatic church circles and I saw it happen to pastors that I knew personally that I loved and admired and they went rogue they went charismatic. And all of a sudden, they started employing tactics that would force people to fall over when they prayed for them. Oh, there's a half a dozen little tricks you can pull from a quick, you know, push on the forehead like that, which can quickly cause somebody to lose their balance all kinds of little stunts, okay? And also there's a psychological element. Many people come up and uh, they assume this is going to happen, so therefore they, 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 they quote-unquote let it happen. No, they don't let it. They make it happen. And in charismatic circles, the churches and charismatic ministries were always very obliging so that you could go ahead and just fall. And one of the little techniques they used to use was they always had ushers who would stand behind you. And they'd put their hands on your back so you knew they were there. Guess what I did when I pastored my first church? i tell you, I'm... I know, I'm nuts. You can think I'm nuts. Don't bother me. You're not going to offend me. When I pastored my first church, I told my church people, I said, when I pray for somebody, don't you dare put your hand on them. Don't you dare touch them. Don't you dare send them a message. There's somebody back here to catch you. I said, if they're slain, it better be God or else they're going to crack their noggin wide open. Because when it's God, there will be no harm. There will be no injury. If it's not God, you're going to wind up with a concussion. And I said, nobody touches somebody 
when I'm laying hands and praying for them. Don't you dare. And when I lay hands on people and pray for people, I am exceptionally careful that I never physically do anything that could uh, lend itself to pushing them over. Literally, to this day, I'm very careful. I always make absolutely certain that I do nothing that could ever be misconstrued in such a fashion. And yet, I've laid hands on, I can't even tell you how many people and seen the Spirit of the Lord lay them flat on the ground. But when I lay hands on them, it is simple, it is plain. I, the Bible doesn't say I got to, you know, wag your head around till your neck wants to break. Just sit and lay your hands on them. And I'm very careful when I lay hands on people. All right? Because I, if it's going to happen, it's going to be God. I remember one lady come to my first church. And uh, she had called me on the telephone. She and her husband were selling their home in Connecticut. And they were going to move to Pennsylvania. He wanted to move to a farm and live you know, kind of off the land and all this. And she was not comfortable with this notion and had really become affected by a spirit of fear and a spirit of anxiety to such a degree that she couldn't sleep at night and she was having just nightmares and just being vexed by the enemy. You know, the enemy was trying to terrify her. You do this with your husband, oh, it's going to be awful, and you know, all this stuff. Well, she attended an Assembly of God church up the road a few miles from where my church was, but she heard about my church and said, I've heard that people really get delivered and people get healed in your church. She said, I was wondering if, if we come there, would you please pray for me? I need the Lord to deliver me. I said, absolutely, certainly. So she and her husband showed up for church one Sunday. I knew the church she'd come from. It was as charismatic as charismatic could get. The pastor knocked everybody over and everybody fell down. And there were, there were people there to catch in. I mean, they had all the gadgets. They had their ladies running around with uh, big old scarves to cover their legs after they fell. Again, I got news for you. If it's God, you're not going to have to cover their legs. I had never seen the Lord one time slay anybody slain in the Spirit. And I grew up in a church where this happened a lot. And again, without anybody there to catch anybody, without anybody, without any of the games, never one time did I see a lady's skirt wind up over her crotch or fly up over her head. Uh-uh. I'm going to tell you something. When God does it, I promise you, You'd be shocked at how beautiful it all comes together. The Lord's not going to embarrass you. He's not going to make you look stupid. If God's powerful enough, honey, to cause you not to be able to stay on your feet, trust me, He's powerful enough to keep your dress down below your knee. And uh, I knew the church she went to the pastor there, I loved him, but he had gone rogue. He had gone full-blown charismatic, and I, I wouldn't even go to that church anymore. I used to visit up there for a good while. I wouldn't even go up there anymore. I was so sick of the place. After the pastor, who I knew for many years, literally pushed me over once, I said, never again. I'll never I don't want nothing to do with that church. I've been slain in the spirit for real, and I had that happen. And honey, I got news for you. It wasn't God. It had nothing to do with God. And I didn't appreciate it. And it turned me off like you can't believe. So this lady comes to our church. She and her husband. At the end of the service, she come up and said, Pastor, would you pray for me? I need deliverance. I said, yes, ma'am. So I began to pray for her. And it was so funny. Because she kind of started. She was a big woman. And she started kind of waddling backwards a little bit. And I knew what she was doing. She's waiting to see if somebody was going to tap her back and let her know, we're back here to catch you. And my people parted like the Red Sea. 
Not a soul. They because they knew what I said. Nobody was going to touch her. Nobody's going to, you know, I told them, said, don't you do that. We're not a charismatic church. We're a Holy Ghost filled, fire baptized, Pentecostal church, honey. If it's God, it'll happen. If it ain't God, it won't happen. And boy, she just waddled, and I mean, she kept waddling and kind of leaning back. It was so funny because she knew what she was doing. I knew what she was doing. Long story short, she didn't fall, but she got delivered. <laughs> she called me a few days later, shouting, thrill out of her mind. She said, oh, pastor, 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 oh, my God, you won't believe. She said, I, God delivered me. She said, I went home that night. She said, I went to sleep. I slept all night. She said, I've had peace. Oh, God gave me peace. She said, I haven't had a bad dream. I haven't had a nightmare. I haven't had a bad thought. She said, whoo, it's just been wonderful. She said, oh, God. She said, and you won't believe this. I said, what? She said, my husband changed his mind. He doesn't want to go to Pennsylvania anymore. I said, oh, well, that's wonderful. She said, yes. Yeah. She said, he wants to stay in Connecticut and he wants us to start going to your church. See, when it's God, folks, don't put God in a box. Do not put God in a box. Do not think for a moment that this has to happen or that has to happen. You know, when I get prayed for, I should speak in tongues as a sign that God has done. No. That may happen sometimes. Uh, you know, I should be slain in the spirit. No, that may or may not happen. Do you follow what I'm saying? Don't go up with any anticipations or expectations because I'm going to tell you a little secret about God. You come up with an anticipation or an expectation, he'll do it another way just to confound you. That's what I've found. All right, so this is why I'm using the analogy with the Corinthians of a charismatic church. They were very much a charismatic church, and they needed good, sound Pentecostal teaching. Okay, so here's what Paul writes to this charismatic church at Corinth. He begins chapter 14, 1 Corinthians, by saying, Follow after charity or love and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. That's verse 1. I'm going to stop right there. Notice how this, this is something you don't see in the church world today. Notice how the emphasis of the apostles constantly to the church is on love. They're constantly reminding the church, folks, the first thing you ought to be focused on, the first thing you ought to be concerned about, the first thing you ought to be pursuing above and beyond anything else is love. Boy, can you imagine if uh, evangelicals and fundamentalists in America were actually taught this today? How different would the church be? He said, no, follow after charity. That's how he starts. Then he said, and desire spiritual good. There's nothing wrong with wanting the gifts to manifest themselves. There's nothing wrong with wanting the Lord to uh, use you in the area of spiritual gifts. There's nothing wrong with that. But don't lose your focus. Always, 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 always be primarily focused on love. Don't get so caught up in anything else that you lose sight of the importance of love. Because love is how the church of Jesus Christ is identified. Jesus said, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples. If ye talk in tongues, no. If ye shout and dance, no. He said, 
if ye have love one to another. Okay? So he said, and desire spiritual gifts, but immediately we see the first inkling of the importance of prophecy and why prophecy is way up on the importance list when it comes to the gifts of the Spirit because Paul said, follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. So he said, you know, desire spiritual gifts, but, but you know what? Even more than that, desire that, you, that the Lord might use you in prophecy. Why? Because of all the gifts, prophecy is probably the most important and the most valuable to the church. Okay? He then says in verse 2, For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. So Paul says, when we speak with other tongues, obviously we're not speaking for the benefit of anybody in the room because nobody in the room understands what we're saying. He said, but when you're speaking in an unknown tongue, you're not speaking to the people around you anyway. You're speaking to God. That is an expression from your spirit directly to God. You are specifically worshiping God, praising God, or sending a request to God from your spirit. Okay? And he said, uh, Because no man understands him, how be it in the spirit he speaketh mystery, simply meaning that what he is saying in the spirit is unknown to us. Okay, we don't understand what he is saying. Then goes on to say in verse number three, But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortion, ex exhortation, I mean exhortion, and comfort. So Paul said, when you speak with another tongue, when you speak in unknown tongues, nobody's benefited because nobody understands what you're saying. Your, whatever you're saying is directed to God. It's not directed to those around you. He said, but when you prophesy, he said, now that's a very different thing because when you prophesy, you are speaking to men. You are speaking to the church. You are speaking to those in your company. And you're speaking to them and it's serving the purposes of edification exhortation or comfort so he's saying prophecy serves these important functions it either is edifying it is exhorting or it is comforting so prophecy serves a very potent purpose in corporate worship and in corporate meetings. When someone prophesies, the church is being edified, the church is being exhorted, the church is being comforted. He goes on in verse 4 to say, He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. So when you're speaking in tongues, is it doing good for somebody? Absolutely. It absolutely is. But who's it doing good for? For you. Not for anybody around you, not for anybody hearing you. But then he said, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. So do you see where prophecy has a value for the entirety of the church, whereas speaking with other tongues 
holds value only for the one who is speaking in other tongues, okay? So now he said in verse 5, I would that ye all spake with tongues. It's for my Baptist friends who love to twist and pervert the Bible to make it say what they want it to say. They try to basically tell you that Paul, Paul says that, you know, speaking in tongues is worthless. It has a, that is not even close to what Paul said, not even within a million miles. He said, I wish ye all spoke with tongues. Then he says, but rather that ye prophesied, for greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. So now Paul is saying, I wish everybody spoke in tongues. I wish everybody spoke in tongues. But even more than that, I wish everybody prophesied. Said, because prophecy serves a far greater purpose and a far greater function than merely speaking with tongues. But then there's a caveat. He said, except that it be a message in tongues followed by interpretation. Because a message in tongues followed by interpretation does what? edifies the whole church. Once again, the whole body is benefited through tongues and interpretation. Do you see? So, prophecy edifies the entire body, so does tongues with interpretation. All right? But we're going to we're going to see in a little while that even though they're both edifying or satisfying or building up of the entirety of the church, they actually have two different purposes, and we'll see that in a little bit. I don't want to get ahead of myself. In verse number 6, the Apostle Paul said, Now, brethren, if I come unto you <coughs> speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge, or by prophesying, or by doctrine. So Paul is here very simply saying, if I come to you speaking in an unknown tongue, it, it's not doing, it's providing no value. It's providing nothing for you. He said, but rather what would provide value is if I'm speaking to you by revelation or I'm sharing a revelation. He said, or if I am speaking by knowledge, I'm sharing something uh, by reason of knowledge, or if I'm prophesying, or if I'm sharing doctrine or expounding upon doctrine. In verse 7 he said, and even things without life giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped? Or heart. So here again, Paul is saying, we we know just from musical instruments, we understand that if something is not being played in a skillful manner, if it's not being played in a way that it can be understood, then even the sound produced by musical instruments has no value for us. It, it doesn't do anything for us. I don't know, a lot of people love, you know, uh, some of this rock and roll mess they do on electric guitars where the guitar is made to scream and howl and make all this racket. Uh, personally, I much prefer when an instrument is creating melodious music. I'm not as impressed by an instrument that's just screaming and hollering and making all these noises. No, if I'm going to get anything out of it, I appreciate when that instrument is being skillfully used 
to create something that sounds, you know, if you're playing a guitar, I understand you're playing a guitar. If you're playing a drum, I understand you play. If you're playing a trumpet, I understand you're playing a trumpet. Paul said, for if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? So Paul says, armies for centuries have used horns in order to send messages to the troops. You know, back in ancient times, they didn't have radios, they didn't have the communication systems we have today. So if you wanted to sound reveille, if you wanted to sound retreat, if you wanted to sound charge, and you wanted to be able to notify thousands of men, you know, across many acres or miles, uh, that you were uh, wanting everyone to do a certain thing, then there were certain tones, there were certain sounds they would use on the trumpet. You know, in modern times, we know... <laughs> you know, that means charge, okay? And so Paul said, you know, if the sound, if you just take the trumpet and go... So, the soldiers don't know what to do. You're not making anything clear to them. Well, the same thing is true of language. The same thing is true when you're speaking. If, if you're speaking in an unknown tongue, you know, I often, when I'm, when I'm referring to somebody speaking in tongues or referring to someone speaking another language that I don't know, a lot of times I'll just say, Revity, tat, tat, tat. You'll hear me say that when I'm preaching, you know. Basically, I'm just making noise with my mouth. I'm saying, that's all you're doing as far as anybody understands in terms of their hearing. You're just making noise, you know. Revity, tat, tat, tat. Or bobbity, bop, bop, bop. You know, however I might choose to say it at any given time. Paul goes on to say, In verse 9, so likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. He said, if you're not speaking that which people can easily understand, then you're just making noise into the air. You're just putting sounds out into the atmosphere. There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian to me. Obviously, a barbarian uh, in, in ancient times would be someone without education, without understanding. So he said, if I'm sitting there and, and I'm not speaking something that's understandable, then I'm being a barbarian to the guy next to me. As far as he's concerned, I'm standing there going, ba 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 And as far as I'm concerned, the guy next to me is a barbarian because he ain't going to understand what I'm saying either. He said, so really, what do we do? We're debasing both of us. We're, we're literally putting us both in a bad position because I don't get them, they don't get me. We're not communicating. There's nothing beneficial going on here. There's nothing of any particular value going on here. Verse 12, even so ye... For as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. So now Paul says, it's, it's all well and good that y'all are wanting spiritual gifts and you're wanting the Lord to use you. He says, but tongues is not the end all and be all. Many of the gifts serve a purpose whereby the church is edified and the church 
benefits. And that includes prophecy, that includes word of knowledge, that includes word of wisdom, um, that includes tongues with interpretation, many of the gifts. So he's saying there are all kinds of gifts. You know, why, why is it y'all are so hung up on tongues when there are so many gifts that benefit the church? You should be desiring that the Lord use you uh, in an area that's going to edify and build up and uh, provide nourishment and benefit to the church as a whole. Verse 13, Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, listen carefully, my, my, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. So Paul says, Rather than being caught up and speaking with other tongues, you should be praying that if the Lord, if you speak with other tongues, that God's using you in the area of tongues with interpretation, because at least then the church is benefiting as a whole. Okay? It says, if, if, if you are so wanting the Lord to use you in the area of tongues, well then you ought to be Asking the Lord, Lord, give me the gift of interpretation of tongues as well, so you can use me in tongues and interpretation, so that the whole church can benefit. And and we're gonna it's gonna get into more specific about the the role of tongues in worship and in the church and what have you. Okay, all right. So he goes on to say. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth. This is something that even Pentecostals have gotten wrong for years and years and years and years. Many people erroneously think that when they speak with other tongues that that's the Holy Ghost speaking through me. No. Wrong. That is the Spirit of God inspiring your spirit to speak. How do you know when your spirit is speaking versus when you're speaking from your head or from your intellect? Your spirit, when it speaks, speaks in a language different than a language you have cognitive uh, understanding and use of. Okay? And so... Uh, Paul said, no, when you, when you speak in an unknown tongue, he says, your spirit is praying. Your spirit is speaking. That's why I said, even Sunday, while I was preaching, I've watched Sunday's message a couple of times. Bless me. And there are times when I'm preaching, and boy, I'm going to tell you, my spirit gets happy with what I'm talking about. And, 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 and boy, I'm telling you, deep down in my soul, I just want to shout and worship God a while. And sometimes that manifests itself by me speaking in tongues for a moment. You know, that's just giving my spirit, that's kind of like a little bit of a uh, uh, pressure relief valve on a, a pressure cooker, you know, and it, that's just kind of letting a little bit of that pressure out. My spirit is getting happy. My spirit's getting joyful. Uh, what I'm talking about and what I'm preaching about is is touching me not not just up here, but way deep in here. And I get so excited that sometimes people will just kind of blurt something in the Holy Ghost in the Spirit just for a moment, and that's that's almost like a pressure valve release, you know, just a little, little of that pressure. Otherwise, I'm going to explode, and I'm going to shout and run the aisles, and I won't be preaching for a while. So if I'm going to keep preaching, i got to let some of this pressure out, okay? I don't pretend that doing that is benefiting y'all. I know better than that. But it's benefiting me.
So then Paul says, what is it then in verse 18, uh, 15? What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit and I will pray with the understanding also. Notice Paul here is not saying speaking in tongues has no place. It's not what he said at all. He said, no, 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 no. It's about striking balance. He said, I'll pray in the Spirit, and I'll pray with my understanding also. Then he said, I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. Again. If you listen to Baptist preachers and those who preach against speaking in tongues, and they, they'll sit there and say, oh, this is of the devil, this isn't God, this is blah, 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 you know. Then in the next breath they'll say, and even if it was God, you're not supposed to speak in tongues unless you interpret. That is not what Paul said. That is not what Paul said. Right here he says, in verse 15, as clear as you can say it, it's about striking balance. If you're going to do one, you must do the other. There has to be a balance. At least if there's balance, at least if there's a mixture, then those around you are still able to benefit from that which they hear and understand. So it's one thing to walk into church Amen, go home. It's another thing to go to church. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Lord, I love you. Lord, touch sister so-and-so. Touch her body, God, and heal her. Lord, touch the pastor. Help him to preach. You follow what I'm saying? When you mix it up, when you, when you have both, now you're at least providing something in the mix that others can benefit from. Why is this important? Because like I've taught, like I've talked about many times, corporate public worship is uh, a, a great deal about piggybacking off of one another. Many times we come into the house of God and we may not be of a mind to pray. We may not be of a mind to worship. We may uh, be new to the faith. We may be uh, novices in the church. And we don't even know yet how to worship. We don't even know yet how to pray. Well, how do you learn? You learn through observing. You learn from examples. So... If the guy next to you, the whole service is, what do you learn? Nothing. You have no clue what to do or how to do it. But when you hear the saints around you praying, when you hear the saints around you worshiping, the Word of God talks about offering unto the Lord the fruit of our lips. That literally simply means saying worshipful things. So that's why during worship, you know, when we're finished singing a song, the pastor says, thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I'm not doing that just to fill space. That is offering unto the Lord the fruit of my lips. Do you follow? I love you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, God, you've been so good to me. Jesus, thank you, Lord. You know what I'm saying? That is offering unto the Lord the fruit of your lips. New believers and uh, folks who are new to the church, they're not going to learn how to do that if, if all you're ever doing is speaking in tongues. So, also, when it comes to praying, I've talked about this before. We have somebody in our church in Dallas that I used to, couldn't stand to pray with. I couldn't stand to be in the same room when that person would come to prayer meeting. I quit doing prayer meetings because this person was one of the only people that ever showed up. Oh Lord, I'm 
such a miserable so-and-so. Oh, God, I'm so horrible and so terrible in Jesus. I don't know where I'd be, Lord, if it wasn't for you, Lord. Um, not one word of what he's saying is worshipful. Not one word of what he's saying is the fruit of his lips. Do you know what, what he's saying is called? It's called lamentation. He's lamenting about what a miserable so-and-so he'd be if it wasn't for the Lord. If a new believer comes in and they hear that guy carrying on like that, are they going to learn how to effectively pray? No. No. They're not going to learn how to effectively. The Bible said the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man. What he's doing is not effectual. He's not saying anything. He's not He's not putting anything before the Lord. He's not, you know, uh, uh, bringing any petitions before the Lord. You know what I'm saying? And so it's important for new believers and, and for believers who just for whatever reason may not quite be in the mood, so to speak, for prayer, for worship. It's important that they be able to hear believers around them, saints around them. Because a lot of times, as you're hearing those around you, you know what? It's a lot of times that'll inspire you. That'll kind of give you, you know what? Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, yeah, Lord, thank you, Jesus. You have been good to me. Thank you, Lord. I, I have a house. You know, the guy next to you may be saying, thank you, Lord. I've got a... I've got a good spouse. I've got a nice house to live in. I've got clothes. I've got food. I'm not going hungry, Lord. I've been, I've gone through times where I was hungry and I'm not hungry. And you know, and all of a sudden you're hearing this and you begin to think about what he's saying and you're saying, yeah, that's true. And then you are able to thank the Lord similarly. Do you follow what I'm saying? And see, so we're able to piggyback from one another whether it be worship, whether it be prayer, we're able to piggyback from one another and learn from one another. This is one reason why in the Pentecostal church and in the church of the Bible, they didn't pray silently. Nowhere in Scripture do you see any example of the believers praying in a silent fashion. You go into First Baptist and somebody's praying and the only person you hear is the guy who's leading the prayer. Going to First Pentecostal Church and the guy who's leading the prayer kind of almost gets buried by everybody else in the church who begins to pray with him. Why? Because we're supposed to pray fervently. We're supposed to pray effectually. We're supposed to put our heart into it, our emotion into it our feelings into it. That's what God desires. He wants us to come before Him, not in a religious fashion, but He wants us to come before Him in a real fashion. You know the old saying, be real, you know? He wants you to come before Him and be real. If you're feeling sad, then talk to Him sad. If you're feeling glad, then talk to Him glad. If you're upset, he's not going to worry that you're yelling. If you're happy, he's not going to worry that you're shouting. Do you follow what I'm saying? So, uh, so Paul tells us, you know, he says, it's just important, it's important that there be a mixture. It's important that there be a balance. He said, when we pray in an unknown tongue, then, uh, We're edifying ourselves unless, of course, we are being used to give a message and then interpret, okay? So then Paul said, um, what is it then? I will pray with the Spirit and I will pray with the understanding also. So is the pastor wrong to speak in tongues every once in a while during the course of... No. 
Is there anything wrong with a member of the church praying in the spirit during the course of the service? No. You follow? Said, I'll do both. I'll pray in the spirit and I'll pray with my understanding also. I'll sing with the spirit and I'll sing with my understanding also. Okay? So then... He said, else when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say amen at thy giving of thanks, seeing he understandeth not what thou sayest. So see right there is an illustration of what I'm talking about when I talk about piggybacking. Paul said, if you're blessing the Lord, if you're offering the fruit of your lips, but you're doing it from your spirit, he said, how's anybody gonna piggyback off of that? How's anybody gonna get anything? How is that gonna help them in their process of prayer or worship? Because they're not understanding anything, okay? That's all Paul, literally, that's all Paul is saying in verse number uh, 16. He said, verse 17, For thou verily givest thanks well, but the other is not edified. He said, there ain't nothing wrong with what you're doing. What you're doing is fine. But the only problem is the, the people around you, nobody else is benefiting from what you're doing. And because corporate worship and because uh, corporate prayer is uh, an opportunity for us to piggyback and learn from one another. So then you need to be mindful so that others can benefit, others can grow, others can learn, others can piggyback off of you, okay? He then goes on to say in verse 18, I thank my God I speak with tongues more than ye all. So Paul confesses, I do a lot of talking in tongues. I do a lot of praying. I got news for you, honey. I do a lot of talking in tongues. I do a lot of praying in the Spirit. Tommy's at work 10 hours a day. I'm sitting here at the house all by my lonesome. And I got news for you. I pray a lot while I'm here at the house by myself. An awful lot. And a lot of that I'm talking in tongues. And some of it I'm shouting. And some of it I'm dancing. And some of it I'm jumping. And some of it I'm getting happy. Because when I'm by myself, I just worship God and get happy and have church all over the place. I do it in my car, driving. That's one reason, I, you know, I've talked about it before, but that's one reason I used to love driving up to Oklahoma from Dallas, you know, about a four-hour drive. Man, did I love those drives when I'd be by myself. Holy mackerel. I'd have the best prayer meetings. If you had asked me to pray for you, if there was a need you were needing me to pray about, and I made a trip to Oklahoma, I got news for you, honey. You got prayed for. Trust me, you did. Because <laughs> while I'm driving, I'm praying for everything and everybody and every, you know. And I'm just, I'm just having the time of my life. There ain't nothing better than being alone with Jesus. There's nothing better than just having a good old-fashioned Holy Ghost visitation by yourself, except for having a good old-fashioned visitation when you're with a bunch of Holy Ghost-filled people. Then it's kind of it's kind of multiplied in joy because it's a wonderful corporate experience to have. Paul said, I thank God I speak in tongues more than y'all. He said, yet... Verse 19, yet in the church I had rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. 
So do you see, do you simply see the emphasis? He, Paul is over and over and over again trying to drive home this concept. These people are tongue happy. They are tongue obsessed, okay? All they want to do is come into the church house and the whole service through. And they think it's spiritual. I would be willing to bet that the church at Corinth became so obsessed with speaking with other tongues based on what I read Paul writing, I get the impression that they probably had preachers who got up and literally would I've known preachers that did almost that. And they'd act like they were doing the church some big favor by preaching a message in the spirit and everybody in the church didn't get a thing in the world out of it. Only problem is the church at Corinth was so obsessed with talking in tongues that they probably thought that was glorious. Not because they, they actually got anything out of it in a substantive way, but to them it was like, oh, isn't it just wonderful that Brother Jones got up and delivered a whole message in the Spirit. Hallelujah. I've talked about it before, the Catholic Church for centuries, centuries, conducted their mass in Latin, regardless of the native language of the country they were conducting the mass in. Nobody in the building understood one word that was being said. Nobody understood what the ritual they were participating in uh, meant. had no clue. They're sitting there week after week after week going to these services and thinking that, oh, I'm just getting spiritual benefit by osmosis, you know. Well, this is what the Corinthian church had become. They thought that people just got spiritual benefit from speaking in other tongues, in a sense, through osmosis, you know. Same exact mentality. When you understand that, then you understand why Paul is saying what he's saying and why he just keeps trying to make this point over and over and over again. Okay? So he said, I'd rather speak five words with my understanding that, my, but that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. See, again, that implies to me that maybe even the teachers and the preachers were just, you know, talking in tongues. He's saying you can do the people more benefit by saying five words in a language they understand than 10,000 words in a language they don't understand. Then goes on to say, verse number 20, Brethren, be not children in understanding. How be it in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. So he's saying, you know, in other words, grow up in terms of understanding, in terms of being angry and malicious and, and hateful. He said, be like kids in that regard. You know, they get over it pretty quick. Kids can be mad at each other one minute and playing with each other the next minute. You know, I remember my brother Michael and I, when we were kids, you know, sometimes we'd fight and fight. Boy, we'd be going at it tooth and toenail. My mother would get aggravated and tell us, uh, shut up and go to bed and lay in our beds. And she didn't want us to even talking to each other. All of a sudden, we got along like angels. <laughs> Paul said, in the law, it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people. <coughs> and yet, for all that, will they not hear me, saith the Lord. Wherefore, tongues are for a sign. Now listen, this is where we understand the difference between the operation of tongues with interpretation 
and prophecy. He said, wherefore? So now, first of all, he quotes a passage from the law, from the Old Testament. And then he says, wherefore, therefore. So what's he telling us? He's saying, this passage says this for this reason. For what reason? It's referring to men speaking with other tongues. So that prophecy literally was meant to foretell of the New Testament experience of speaking with other tongues. He said, wherefore, he said, wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them that believe. Aha! Tongues serves one function. They are a sign for unbelievers. Prophecy serves a completely different function. It is for the benefit, the nourishment, the edification of believers. So, Tongues with Interpretation has one audience that it's meant to benefit, and Prophecy has another audience that it's meant to benefit. Prophecy is worthless to the unbeliever. Now, Tongues with Interpretation is not worthless to the believer, but we don't need it. We don't need tongues with interpretation because we already believe. We don't need the sign. So a lot of people in the Corinthian church were of the mindset that, uh, oh, you know, tongues with them, that's a sign that God is in the midst of us. And Paul is saying, you don't need that. You can't discern when God is present. When someone prophesies, you've got to be able to discern whether or not it is God speaking. So why in the world would you need tongues in order to know that God is there and God is moving and God is, is present? You know, say, no, tongues, they're not there as a sign to believers. They're there as a sign to unbelievers. Do you follow? Oh, wait a minute. So you mean... Speaking with other tongues in the church might actually have some benefit for unbelievers. According to First Baptist Church, nobody in the church should ever speak with other tongues unless there's an interpretation that follows glory to God. Hallelujah. But then again, it's of the devil and it's Satan anyway, so it doesn't even matter. See how stupid? They know good and well it's not the devil. They're, they're saying that in one breath. But they know good and well it's not the devil. Because then they turn around and they try to apply uh, Paul's standard of behavior within the church, you know, uh, his standard of conduct concerning tongues in the church as if they're legitimate. Well, it's either one or the other. And if it's one, then the other doesn't even matter, does it? Okay? So then Paul goes on to say, continue. Wherefore tongues, verse 22, are, are for a sign not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. I got I to gotta, I, I gotta use this, this uh, quick... Uh, story. We had a man at the Riverside Church of God who was Native American uh, heritage, Brother Bledsoe. And Brother Bledsoe, when he was seeking the baptism of the Holy Ghost, he asked the Lord. He said, Lord, I don't even know if it's appropriate for me to ask this. He said, but when you fill me with the Holy Ghost, he said, I wish you'd let me speak in the tongue of my ancestors
Now look at me, I'm covered in goosebumps. I can't even think about this without just getting covered in goosebumps. When he received the Holy Ghost, that man began to speak in a language that was so clearly Native American of some sort. And it was beautiful. I, I, I can't even tell you. It was beautiful. When you hear him speak, it just, you could be the biggest sinner in town. You could be a prostitute right off of South Main Street. And honey, you would get chills when that man spoke in tongues. It was the most beautiful sounding language I've ever heard in my life. There was something about it that was so beautiful, almost melodious. And the Lord used to use him to give messages in tongues and then somebody would interpret, you know. Whew. If I had a nickel for every time somebody visited our church who had never been in a Pentecostal church, who had never been near anybody speaking with other tongues, and they would say, Oh my God, when that man started talking in that, like Indian, you know, Native, and, oh my goodness, I just was covered with chills. I never felt, it was like God sat down right next to me. I could just feel God so real and so wonderful. It's a sign to unbelievers. Even without the interpretation, it's a sign to unbelievers. What is it a sign of? It's a sign that God's real. Something that's going on here is real. When you hear somebody speaking with an unknown tongue and it's real, honey, I'm going to tell you something. Unless you're a very cynical, nasty, judgmental, critical person, you have that sense that something about this is, so there's, there's a certain realness, you know, that hits you, it strikes you. There, there's something going on. I may not understand it, but there's something going on here that's kind of interesting, you know. When somebody delivers a message in an unknown tongue, I've talked about this before, the church immediately goes silent. And the funny thing is, nobody, I grew up in the Pentecostal movement, I grew up in a church where the gifts of the Spirit were in operation. We used to have tongues with interpretation a lot when I was a kid. And I'm going to tell you, never one time did I ever hear a pastor go, shh, 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 or anybody go, shh, shh, quiet down. Never one time. When a message begins to come out, and it is a message in, in tongues, it's like the Spirit of God literally just puts a blanket of silence over the congregation. All of a sudden, the whole congregation. I've been in churches that are huge, huge churches with thousands of people. And you let somebody start to give a message in tongues and whoosh, that whole congregation goes silent. You can barely hear the guy all the way on the other side of the auditorium, but the whole congregation goes silent. It's a sign. That shows unbelievers something divine is happening, something supernatural is happening. How is it that this guy is saying something way over here? And literally, you can barely hear him. Oh, way, 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 way over there. And yet the entire congregation goes dead silent. And then, after he's done delivering the message in an unknown tongue, the congregation remains silent. And we wait until the interpretation once the interpretation comes, then the service simply picks up where it left off and you go right back to singing or you go right back to praying or you go right back to worshiping or you go right back to preaching, whatever the case might be. But this is just, 
this is a sign to the unbeliever. Even in the Old Testament, God said, with men of other tongues, he said, I'm going to use other tongues as a sign. In verse 23, Paul writes, If therefore the whole church be come together into one place, now listen, and all speak with tongues. So this has got to give you a little insight as to what the church at Corinth must have been like, okay? He said, If therefore the whole church be come together into one place, and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers. Now, unlearned would simply mean they're not exposed to your doctrine. They're not exposed to your practices. There are a lot of times somebody might come in who's an unbeliever, but their mother's Pentecostal or their grandma's Pentecostal, so they understand, they know what speaking in tongues is. You know what I'm saying? But Paul's saying, but what if somebody comes in and they have no exposure? to your doctrine. They have no understanding of your practices. Or they're altogether an unbeliever. He said, will they not say that you're mad? He said, aren't they going to think you're nuts? If the whole church comes together and everybody, everybody, but he didn't say most people, he didn't say if many people are speaking in tongues, or if most, no, he said everybody is speaking in tongues he said they're going to think you're nuts they're going to think you're crazy but if all prophesy and there come in one that believeth not or one that is unlearned meaning unexposed to your doctrine or teaching he is convinced of all he is judged of all. Why? Because he understands what's being said. And, verse 25, and I'm going to have to finish up with verse 25 today, and I'm going to mark it, so I'll remember next week where we end it. And thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest. And so, falling down on his face, will he worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. All right. So Paul has, in synopsis, through verse 25, we'll start next Wednesday at verse 26. 1 Corinthians 14, let me mark it before I forget. Okay, there we go. And next week is going to be, today is what, the 19th? So next week will be the 26th, right? Uh, 23, okay. So in synopsis again, Paul is simply saying, the church at Corinth was tongue-obsessed. They thought the more they talked in tongues, the more... It was spiritual, and the more it was demonstration of spirituality. They didn't understand the concept of uh, the need for understanding in worship and in prayer because we learn from one another, we benefit from one another, we edify one another by hearing what one another is saying in worship and in prayer and so on and so forth. And so does Paul say, uh, tongues has no value. It has no place in public worship. No, not by a million miles. That is not even remotely close to what the Apostle Paul said. The Apostle Paul said, I will pray with the Spirit. I will pray with my understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit. I will sing with my understanding also. He said, no, it's simply a matter of there has to be balance. You cannot become so obsessed with uh, being in the spirit that you absolutely lose sight of the fact that something has to be 
done in the course of worship, in the course of prayer, in the course of preaching and teaching that is understandable or else the whole exercise is without value. Okay. And again, you, you read the words of Paul. It's pretty easy to see by the way he says certain things, just how goofy the, the Corinthians must have gotten, you know, how far off base they must have gone. And, uh, and believe it or not, folks, I'm telling you, I grew up in the Pentecostal movement. When the charismatic movement came, you'd be shocked at how much like this a lot of charismatic churches became. They literally became tongues obsessed, you know, and obsessed with uh, evidences of the presence of... I don't need people falling over in a church service for me to know that the Spirit of the Lord was powerfully there. I don't need uh, people, for that matter, I don't need people to dance and shout and run the aisles for me to know that the Spirit of the Lord was powerfully there. I was in a Church of God camp meeting years ago. I'll never forget it. Oh, I'll never forget it. One of the most powerful church services I've ever been in in my life. The Spirit of God was in that service in, in such a powerful way. It was not a shouting service. It was not a tongue talking service, it was not a run in the aisle service but it was one of the most powerful experiences I've ever had in my entire life in the presence of God, I will never forget that service um, I'll never forget it it was Texas camp meeting and the spirit of the Lord came down in that meeting and the place was virtually silent but you literally felt <sighs> I, I, I don't hardly know how to describe it you literally felt the love of God the love of God in a way that just blew your mind absolutely blew your mind Nobody was saying anything. The preacher wouldn't say anything. Nobody was. So we weren't singing any song. We, nothing. The congregation went quiet. And all of a sudden, you just felt this amazing, like somebody just dropped a blanket of the most loving, compassionate, warm embrace that you've ever felt in your life over the entire congregation. And people just stood there and began to weep and we just bathed in it. We just basked in it for a period of time. And after the service, my God, I remember we were talking to one another and saying, have you ever in your life experienced anything like that? My God. And we were all saying the same identical thing, you know. My God, I've never felt the love of God. If you ever wanted to know God was real, if you ever wanted to know that the Spirit of the Lord is real, holy mackerel, in that service, you would come away knowing not only that God's real, but you came away from that service knowing, knowing that what Paul said, nothing shall separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Nothing. Boy, I mean to tell you, you knew when, when the Word of God said God is love, not He loves. God is love. 
it was like his presence in that particular meeting was such that the one attribute of his nature that you sensed wasn't his holiness, wasn't his uh, perfection. You don't, no, that's not what you, at that moment, that's not what you experienced. You experienced his absolutely pure, genuine love. You, it, it, it just, it was mind-blowing. I just can't even begin to explain what it was like. I never felt anything like it in my life. God's people don't need tongues to prove that God is present. We don't need tongues to prove that God is moving. We don't need tongues to prove anything to us as believers. Because when you grow up and you mature in the faith, you become in tune to the Spirit of God and you're able to, to discern, you're able to distinguish, you're able to tell when God is present. Got news for you uh, in closing. You know, when I watch a lot of our services on online, oh folks, I'm not, I wish to God I had a church like ours to go to when I was young. Man, I'd have given a million dollars we don't have music. Maybe this is one of the reasons. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe this is one of the reasons why God just won't give us people. Maybe this is one of the reasons why God won't give us musicians and won't give us people and won't give us nothing. Because ultimately, all we have is the Word of God and the power of God. Because, honey, if you don't feel the Holy Ghost in our services, your Holy Ghost meter is broken or it is dead. Because I watched Sunday service this week. Holy mackerel. My God, I could feel the Holy Ghost like you can't even begin to believe. Woo. And I sat there and I said, Lord, oh, what I wouldn't have done. If, if, if I'd have been in a church years ago and a preacher got up and preached like that and, and delivered that word, Holy mackerel, I, I don't know what I would have done. I probably would have sprouted wings and flown out of the sanctuary because, man, could I feel the power of God. Man, and for years this has been the case with our church. So maybe, you know, maybe the Lord's just trying to teach this old preacher something, you know. I don't know. But, uh, so anyway, we're, we're on our way. We're about halfway through um, the 14th chapter of the book of 1 Corinthians. I hope y'all are benefiting from this. And uh, if y'all have any comments or any thoughts or any questions you'd like us to address in future Bible studies, please feel free to post them on Facebook, and we will surely try to get to them in the weeks to come. Let's close our Bible study this evening with a word of prayer. Master, we love you, God, and we thank you for this time in the Word of God. It is always so wonderful to talk about the things of God and to study the Word of the Lord, to understand, Lord, your wonderful presence and power, how you manifest yourself to your church how you operate through the people of God in order to communicate to a lost and dying world that you're real, that you love them, you care about them. And more than anything in this world, you want them to believe unto salvation and be saved. Lord, we thank you for this Bible study tonight. We ask God that you would help each and every individual who's been with us this evening, those who will watch later by reason of the internet. Help each and every individual, Lord, to meditate upon that which we've heard this evening. Let us not walk away and the lessons of tonight fade into distant memory, but rather, O oh God, keep them fresh and keep them alive in our thinking until 
we have benefited and learned and grown from that which we've heard. Master, in the name of Jesus, go with your people from this day. We live in a dangerous world in a dangerous time. Keep us under your mighty hand of protection, O oh God, and help this nation. We need revival in the church. We don't need to bring America back to God. We need to bring the church back to God. We need as a people to once again be focused on the spiritual mission to which we have been called, not politics, not uh, culture wars. Master, in the name of Jesus, let the revival begin with us. Go with us from this place, O oh God. Let the peace of God that passeth all understanding reside upon each and every individual, those watching now, those watching later. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.